This is Mike Walter, the former Assistant Deputy Minister for Education in Saskatchewan, and he was recently heavily involved in the Legacy Christian Academy investigation. He was also temporarily put in charge of three of the schools. Until now, because he's resigned in disgrace. Why? Because the man who was in charge of the investigation into sexual abuse in schools in Saskatchewan used his position to try to hit on the survivors of the sexual abuse. I'm 100% serious. This is appalling. The two individuals, Caitlin Erickson and Jennifer Beaudry, share their experiences on the Legacy of Abuse podcast. And some of the stuff is wild. For instance, he knew that there were teachers at the school without degrees, one who didn't even have a grade 12, curriculum that didn't meet standards, and then he invited Caitlin Erickson over to his house to cook dinner and said, quote, you're welcome to spend the night, which is appalling. She was there to discuss her experience of abuse in the school system he was responsible for. And he was using it as an opportunity to hit on her. And Baudry had a similar experience, meeting him for coffee. He wanted to meet for coffee in order to get her file for her. During the meeting, she told the story, he cried, and put his hands on the table gesturing to hold them. And in another message, when he requested to meet again, he said, quote, We should go for drinks, like 10, not coffee, lol, in a text message. And it's worth noting that many of the public statements that he made were completely different than the private statements he made to Erickson and Baudry. Privately, he said that the curriculum wasn't aligned, but publicly he said it was. He specifically called the schools, quote, a culture of accepted deviance. And now Walter has had to step down. He threw away a 33-year career in education. Of course, the ministry takes no responsibility at all, and insists they had no idea what Walter was doing. But this will tell you everything you need to know about the Saskatchewan government. It's nothing to do with helping people. It's all about using power and position to get what you want. So to Mike Walter, good riddance. The Toronto Sun has issued an apology following an incredibly offensive cartoon that they ran. This is the cartoon in question. It is incredibly problematic for a couple of reasons. First and foremost is the way that it portrays Vladimir Zelensky. The exaggerated features are clearly rooted in anti-Semitic tropes. Add on to that the fact that it's clearly suggesting that aid to Ukraine is some form of theft, and this is very problematic. And the Sun issued an apology, walking it back. Although, I'm not sure I exactly buy it. Maybe you shouldn't either. For starters, they don't even acknowledge the anti-Semitism until the fifth paragraph. But also, they've already doubled down. Earlier this week, they received this letter criticizing them for the cartoon. And the response from the editor at the bottom said, quote, Editorial cartoons are meant to exaggerate sentiment, and like it or not, many Americans feel this way. So, is it an apology, or did you just get caught? Because they knew exactly who this cartoonist was, quote, A Christian conservative cartoonist and speaker in that order. But don't worry, he's got a newsletter where he shares conservative commentary and essays on current events from biblical worldview. Oh boy. But yeah, this is your regular reminder. The Toronto Sun is garbage. Don't read it. Don't give them your money. They're bad. So very, very bad. You may be familiar with this brand of COVID test. It was extremely widely distributed in Canada. One problem. A global news investigation found that the company that produces them may have falsified research data. This led to them receiving $2 billion in federal contracts. So the investigation found that they deleted dozens of samples from a study that they submitted to Health Canada. By making those deletions, it made the tests look more reliable and more sensitive. Now, this is all alleged, hasn't been proven in court yet, but it appears to be the case that those deletions gave the false impression that the tests are more reliable than they were. And this has serious implications. These were used to verify whether or not it was safe to see people, safe to go places. They were a huge part of our pandemic response. And it's worth noting that the Canadian government should have known this. A number of different governments, including the Canadian government, did studies on this test. What they found was that it was only effective at detecting the highest viral loads. This type of test basically detected 0% of mild viral loads, at least on the publicly funded studies. And the British and German governments declined to buy those tests as a result. And Health Canada's own internal investigations ruled that the BTNX device was one of the less sensitive tests. Now, Health Canada says that they found no reason to question the scientific integrity of the studies that the company submitted, which raises the obvious question of why they didn't find that when Global did. Health Canada also claimed that the testing results were accurate as long as you followed all of the fine print instructions in the green test, including verifying the results with a PCR test, which is performed at a lab. So they're accurate so long as you follow it up with a completely different and much more accurate test. 
Like, this is an astonishing level of incompetence from the Canadian government. And before you come out telling me that it was entirely Justin Trudeau's fault, it was everybody's fault. Andrew Scheer directly called for this test to be approved in the House of Commons. Trudeau called it an innovative Canadian company that has moved forward with a world-class product. So this was just a colossal failure from top to bottom. Now, a couple of important notes about this test. The issue isn't the results. The issue is the sensitivity. So if you get a positive result from one of these tests, you have COVID. The issue is that it's only detecting the most severe cases. So if you're unsure how to progress, get a PCR test if available, find a more reliable brand of rapid tests, and as always, proceed with caution. If you have symptoms, stay home. Mask up, be safe. Take care of yourselves out there, folks, because it doesn't look like the government is. Alberta Premier Danielle Smith pictured here giving a masterclass on how to accessorize. The paperclip necklace really completes the look. Anyways, she has provided us a new illustration of her standard way of doing things. See, there's an arc that Smith follows. When faced with an issue, she refuses to deal with the issue, denies the existence of the issue, passes blame on the issue, is wrong, and then pretends nothing ever happened. And to illustrate this, let's look at what happened with wildfires. So as wildfires raged across Alberta this summer, Danielle Smith had a simple explanation. She blamed arson. She said she was, quote, very concerned that there are arsonists. Quote, we've got almost 175 fires with no known cause at the moment. And she called in out-of-province investigators. And what did they find? Not arson. In total last year, there were 13 charges laid for arson. And out of the 1,121 wildfires in total, 91 were deemed to be caused by arson. This represents 8.4% of wildfires. That's up very slightly from the five-year average of 7.8%. In total, 0.01% of the total burned land was due to arson. So Danielle Smith put the blame entirely on arson, which was not the cause of the problem. But it enabled her to skate past dealing with the issue all summer. And now, after the fact, when it's abundantly clear that she was wrong in making things up, nothing will happen. So what actually caused the fires? Lightning. 70% of the wildfires were caused by lightning. The reason why the fires got so big and spread so fast is because the conditions were hot, dry, and windy. Not because of arsonists with gas cans running around the forests. And this fire season was 10 times worse than the historical average. As of December 15th, 64 wildfires are still considered active. Like, wildfire season still isn't over, despite it being winter. But things are going great. We're going to pretend it's fine. We're just going to let Danielle Smith lie about arson and then move past it like nothing ever happened. Awesome. One important way that we can help hold governments accountable is to watch their actions, not their words. Politicians lie all the time, but their actions don't lie. Like in this UN vote. This vote specifically was about the right of the Palestinian people to self-determination. And 172 countries voted in favor. Four voted against. Those four? Nauru, Micronesia, Israel, and the United States. For all they claim that they want to help the Palestinian people, they are literally voting against their right to self-determination. There's no way to spin this. This is literally voting for oppression. This is voting to hold down an entire society, to strip the rights of self-determination from a group of humans. Who is okay with this? Who is defending this? And more importantly, who is demanding that the United States government explain this vote? Because what the hell? So this has become the new go-to criticism for renewables. Look at the lifespan of the plants. Wind turbines don't last forever. Okay, neither do coal plants. Neither do nuclear plants. Like, the service life of power plants is all fairly comparable. Like, do you think that regular power plants are eternal somehow? Like, yes, wind turbines need maintenance, but so do power plants. The difference is most wind turbines don't have a bunch of full-time staff maintaining them. So the lifetime tends to be a little shorter just because they're a little bit less regularly repaired and maintained. But the total cost across the lifetime of the device is way smaller. Like, this is just another excuse. How many reasons do you need to not use wind power? It's cheap, it's effective, you just don't like it. You're blind to meaningful facts. Person with a cane emoji, arrow emoji. Ah, bless the internet. I can share as many official reports as I like. They've been confirmed with satellite photography. You can show satellite emissions tracking. You can show whatever you like. But someone on the internet who calls themselves Hamburger Helpa has been hearing other things. They'll keep the plants half-fired 24-7, even without the need of supplemental energy. B 
because Hamburger Helper is indeed an expert on the Chinese energy system. He's got sources. Like, come on. Stop making things up in the comment section. We all know you're making this up. What have you heard? Who are your sources? Name them. This person is illustrating a very unique category of person who's emerged in the last couple of years. Someone who's just made their entire online personality pissing off liberals. Like, they've made their profile picture a liberal logo. They said their comments are just liberal bait, right? You get that. Okay, why? You have nothing better to do with your day than antagonize strangers. You're just going to slip into comment sections and be intentionally wrong just to annoy people. And that'll make things better how? Like, do you think you're going to support your own cause by turning people against it? By making people dislike you? I just don't understand what step two in this plan is. Like, step one, piss off liberals. Step two, mm, step three, profit. Like, come on. It's distinctly possible you need a better hobby. Maybe knitting. Maybe therapy. Probably the second one. This person says, I am a Marxist. Man, no. I like some of Marx's ideas, but I'm not really a Marxist. More of a democratic socialist. But more than that, I'm also some form of puppy. Let's find out, shall we? German Shepherd! I'm a good boy. Oh, these comments always make me giggle. Whenever I say something that a person agrees with, they suddenly think I'm unbiased. I get this lots. Like, I disagree with you all the time, but this takes unbiased. No, it's not. You just agree with it. I have my own biases. Everybody does. Like, I don't come on here and pretend to be unbiased. I stay focused on the factual information and make determinations of my opinion based on that. But I have my own biases. I have my own sets of values and beliefs. Everybody does. And the notion of being unbiased causes some serious problems. Because what happens is news agencies will put both sides of a story on equal footing and create false equivalencies. Like, if you have a thousand scientists saying climate change is a real and urgent problem, and one saying that it's not, and you put one from each side on the news, it makes those things look equivalent. That's making a biased decision, even though it's giving the appearance of being unbiased. You can't get away from bias. It's built in. You just don't notice it when you agree. No. This person reminds me of a very specific type of student. You see, very often you'll experience a student in schools who believes that going to a different school will fix all of their problems. The issue is never their behavior, their actions, what's happening, their choices, any of that. It's always the school, the teachers. They can just get out of there and get somewhere new. It'll fix everything. And fairly regularly, they wind up changing schools. And pretty regularly, I wind up getting updates from the teachers at the new school about what's happening with that kiddo. Just run in at a conference and say, oh, how are things going with so-and-so? And without fail, do you know what winds up happening? Same thing. Same person at a new school. Same issues, same challenges, same struggles. Because they didn't realize that the issues were the issues, not the school. Evans thing here. Pierre Poiliev isn't going to magically fix everything. The problems will persist because he has no intention of solving them. So the question is, who are you going to blame then? What's it going to take for you to actually reflect and look at the causes of the issues that we all face?